Goeie naand, doe my lang. My name is Kinta Burger. I'm the registrar uh, of the University of Johannesburg. I was also a former dean of this faculty, so I have a very close relationship still with some of the colleagues, and it's so good to see all of you here this evening. But it's my honor and privilege to stand in for this evening for the Vice-Chancellor, who sent his regards and his congratulations, but unfortunately he can't be here. So I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor and of the University. Um, I wish to express a warm welcome to all of you. It is um, families and friends that are here and special, special colleagues also from the faculty. And of course the Dean is also here. This is indeed a proud, joyful and landmark achievement for all of you. For Professor Oliver Femi and of course for us here at UJ. I wish to acknowledge in particular Prof. Deborah Meyer the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science, and then Prof. Martin Ntwai Borwa, who is our respondent from the School of Physics to another university in Johannesburg, <laughs> which is our neighbors. And, and so, Prof, uh, thank you for joining us this evening and, and for doing the response um, to the inaugural. Thank you very much. And then, of course, members of Senate and, and academics. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office and deliver their inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its root in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circles of colleagues who are already professors. Now, Prof, you've been a professor already for a while, but this is the formal inauguration. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Thirdly, it stands out as a moment of pride and celebration for the incumbent, the family, the fellow scholars, the university and society. It is a celebration on the achievement of major milestones, contributions to the discipline, and ultimately the impact on society, and we will hear about that more later. So today we are gathered to witness the entry of Professor Oliver Femi to the illustrious community of scholars at the University of Johannesburg. This evening we will listen to you, Prof, as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not culminate once, once the lecture has been given, because it's a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor, with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the discipline. So this is actually for you just the beginning so we're looking forward to your address, and I now call on the Executive Dean to give us a brief introduction. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to introduce you to Samuel Oluwatobi Oluwafemi who was born in Nigeria into the family of Pastor Stephen Ajibola Oluafemi and Evangelist Mary Amope Oluafemi. He completed his primary and secondary education in Ibadan, followed by a BSc Honours Chemical Sciences at Federal University of Agriculture in Nigeria and an MSc in Inorganic Chemistry at University of Ibadan, also in Nigeria. His PhD in Material Chemistry was completed at the University of Zululand and he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Nelson Mandela University. Prof. Uloafemi started his um, academic career 18 years ago as a graduate assistant at Ogun State University that is now known as Olabisi Onabanjo University. And they, from there he moved through the academic ranks to become a senior lecturer in 2009 um, at the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Technology at Walter Sisulu University in South Africa. He joined the Department of Chemical Sciences, DFC, formerly known as Applied Chemistry, at the University of Johannesburg in 2015, where he is now, where he is now a professor and the leader of the NanoWeb Research Group. 
His research interest is in the synthesis of binary, ternary, and quaternary semiconductor nanomaterial and nanostructures, such as quantum dots, metal nanomaterials, core shells, dope nanostructures, and polymer nanocomposites for different applications, which include biological, optical, and environmental applications, also nanotoxicology and water treatment. Prof. Femi is also involved in indigenous knowledge systems using different South African medicinal plants, which involves isolation, extraction, biological activity testing, synthesis of nanomaterial using the plant extract, and packaging for pharmaceutical purposes. Prof. Femi is an NRF-rated researcher with over 150 publications in internationally recognized peer-reviewed journals, conference proceedings, peer-reviewed book chapters, and books. He has attracted over 29 million rand in research grants in the last nine years, um, both for state-of-the-art research equipment and for running costs. He has graduated seven PhDs and 14 MSCs and also mentored two postdoctoral fellows. He is also currently supervising additional PhD, MSc, and postdoctoral fellows. Students under his supervision have won accolades from both local and international bodies, and his research have um, been presented at more than 90 international uh, conferences outside of South Africa, as well as 65 local within the country. And in, at these conferences, he served as a plenary speaker, guest speaker, invited speaker, or presenter. Professor, uh, Professor Lafemi himself has received many accolades um, and recognition of his research, including the C.V. Raman International Fellowship for African Researchers, and he's recognized as an erudite professor by the government of Kerala, India. He's also a visiting professor at Tohoku University. Prof. Lafemi loves teaching, motivating, and mentoring up-and-coming ap academics, and he's also involved in many community engagement activities. Due to his passion for teaching, he established an award of 20,000 Rand last year in his name for the best first year student in the Faculty of Science who also is going through financial problems. He is a committed member of the Men of Issachar Vision the, uh, in Southern Africa. He loves God and his family. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Ulo Afemi to give us his inaugural lecture. First Chancellor in absentia, Professor T. Mawala, the Acting First Chancellor for this occasion, Professor Kinta, the University Management, my Dean, Professor De Bramea, or Professor Seated, the Head of Department, Chemical Sciences, DFC Campus, <coughs> Professor P. Govenda, who is absent for academic reason the head of Department Chemical Sciences, APK Campus, other head of department present, all academics, both non and teaching staff of Department of Chemical Sciences, both DFC and APK Campus, all UJ and non-UJ academics and non-academic staff. I'm not sure we can hear you. Students of the university, families, friends, mentors, collaborators, all invited guests, good evening. All protocol duly observed. Wow. This is the day that the Lord has made. Please join me to rejoice and be glad in it. I will start this lecture by giving honor to whom honor is due. And that is God, who many years ago wonderfully and fearfully netted me in my mother's womb, gave me breath of life, and has been the one covering me up to this moment. One moment I will never forget in my life was a day after my 12th year birthday. I had an accident. I was hit by a car on an express road. And before I know it, I found myself underneath the car and the car was drawing me. It was about to crush my head. God directed it. But the miracle happens when I got to the hospital, no bone 
was broken. And for people who know me, that is the reason why I'm committed to God. If I'm not committed to him, who else will I be committed to? I should have died 12 years when I was age 12. Then there won't be anybody called Professor Samuel Oluwatobi, Oluwafemi. So be here with me. If in my talk you hear God all the time, he holds everything. And my sincere appreciation now goes to my parents, the vehicle that God used to brought me into this world. I want to thank them for their indefatigable love, peer prayer, and sacrifices. They've given me a gift that nobody can take from me, which is to show me the way of the Lord from my infant. Though it pains my heart that this is going to be the first occasion in my life that they will be absent, but I still spoke with them this morning. They were very happy, and as always, send their prayer. My appreciation also goes to the family that love me most in this world. And that is my parent-in-law, to give me a treasure, my heart true, and also took me as their own son. I'm very grateful to them. Now, to the ending of my life after God. <laughs> Can my wife please stand up? It's not many times that you have opportunity to appreciate those who are behind your success. You've been the engine after God behind all the successes that I've made. If you have read, I can write a book from nothing to what where I am today. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your prayer in every way. I travel a lot. I'm always very eager to go home because you are there. Thank you for taking care of the church of God. You are a fatuous woman. The Bible says either find a wife, find a good thing, obtain favor from the Lord. Definitely you are that favor in my life and I will always love you. Thank you. <laughs> of course, I also publish in nature. <laughs> and I'm very grateful to God that my first publication in nature is something I can hold, I can feel, I can touch. And that's my son. Actually, it was a sign from God that Johannesburg, University of Johannesburg, is where I'm supposed to be. We have not even spent one week before he came. And since he was 18 months old, we've been together every weekend in the office. And when I'm tired on weekend and I said, I'm not going, he said, Baba, have you finished your work? <laughs> and that's the question nobody asked me. Because I say, I've never finished. Then we will go. Thank you so much for being my companion every weekend. <laughs> and I pray that you'll be better and greater than myself. Of course, I'm not at this landmark without some people who laid the foundation for my academic career. Starting from Professor Isola Adamson, I always say the one that laid the foundation. And it was the one that taught me that students make professors, not the other way around. And after I laid the foundation, somebody needed to start building the block. And that is my master's supervisor, which is Professor Tim Odiaka. And of course, many people start a house, they couldn't complete it, for one reason or the other. And that is why I'm grateful to Professor Neri Stefa Prasadu. Prof, please stand up, let people see you. <laughs> Without you, the house wouldn't have been completed. And of course, when you complete a house, it needs to be filled. And there comes with my collaborators and mentor. And I'm very grateful to God that several years ago, somebody determined to be a collaborator, to be a mentor, and to be a father to me in South Africa. And he's here today. He's the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Teaching and Learning, University of KwaZulu Natal, Professor Sunka. Please stand up for recognition. <laughs> I have a lot of collaborators. One of them couldn't be here today, Professor Sabu Thomas. I'm grateful to all of them. Of course. 
Our life is built around the world. God has blessed me with people physically, spiritually, in every area. They are a building block. You could see they are the people lifting me. They don't want anything to happen to me. Starting from my friend, my brother, who later become my colleagues, and like Bablika Andrew invited me to join the army of God, in which is the chief in command, Professor Arutiba and his wife, Adiola Arutiba. Thank you, Prof. You are not just a brother in need or in, in need. You are that friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I'm very grateful. Also, we have a special friend in our family, another general of God. And that is Dr. and Dr. Mrs. Kende Ojifini. Thank you very much for gracing this occasion. I have many other people to thank. I can never forget the first person that welcomed me in South Africa. is a professor today. Professor Ajibade Peter is sitting there. Thank you, Prof, for all that you have been doing from my first day. And of course, being not a selfish person, he immediately introduced me to somebody who happened to be the first family I ever have in South Africa. And the first sentence he said, it was in my language, Aburu, you are welcome. Aburu means younger one. Thank you, Professor Adebola Oyedeji and your husband, Professor Kolua Oyedeji. You've been indeed an auntie to me in South Africa. And I'm very grateful to you and to your family. Also, I will want to appreciate my friend, who is my best man. Many people don't know. And he's sitting right here. And that is Dr. Stephen Akenabi. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've always been there, you and your wife, Professor Esther Akenabi. Before she even joined UJ, I used to call her Mama Professor. And I'm glad that all of us will reached that peak of career. Thank you so much for your prayer and all you have done. Of course, life wouldn't have been easy if you don't have food to eat. These are the people from the younger age who says, let's make this man's life better. Starting from my university, I'm talking about those people that employ me full time. I've been part time to so many universities, but starting from Alabi Banjo to Water Susulu University, to Cape Peninsula, everybody represented here by Professor Matoy Toy and my student, Mrs. Chalukile Nedewe. Thank you very much. I'm grateful to them. Because without them, I wouldn't have been in UJ. Of course, the Bible says, wine is for Mary, feast for laughter, money, and sarate all things. Any researcher without money will be frustrated. I'm grateful to those who have given me funding, and those I listed and those I don't. Of course, I will always be grateful to South Africa. And my prayer is always that God should bless this country for investing in me and for giving me the opportunity to achieve my goal. Of course, I won't be standing here today without both my past and present students. Without them, I won't be a professor. Thank you. Most of them are here for your discipline, diligent commitment, and that is what makes me to be where I am today. I'm very grateful to all of you. And of course, to the best department in Africa, Department of Chemical Sciences. You can still go and Google. They've not displaced us. <laughs> My department. <laughs> that is the family that makes sure that I don't need to look back. And I enjoy every day of coming to the office. Starting from the HOD that welcomed me to the present HOD who has given me enormous support. Even though she's not here, she's actually sent another message. I'm very grateful to Professor Govender. And of course, I'm always grateful to my dean, Professor Mayer. You've been a pillar of support for my research. Ma'am, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. In case many people don't know, I'm one of those that is far but always disturb the day. So thank you for always listening to me. I'm very grateful. And lastly, everything go back to him. I will dedicate this talk to God Almighty. My research work and this lecture is tied to how small things can make a big world a better place. The significance of nano in a micro world. I'm into research of synthesis and 
application for transforming this world in which we are. And as we know that the way in which this world is going, the devastation has become a source of concern. And that is why the United Nations formed 17 transform goals. And most of the 10 I'm going to present today, you will find their alignment with this goal. So being a fundamental and applied research, this talk will be divided into three, synthesis and characterization of the compound that I've used, quantum dot and meta nanostructure. And we are going to look at the significance, but because of time, I will limit it to cancer research, and then I will give you a brief of what we still be doing. I'm glad the acting first chancellor said, this is just the beginning. And so you'll be seeing what we'll be doing after this talk. What are nanomaterial? They are class of material having at least one dimension less than 100 nanometer. And when you compare them to bulk material, they possess unique optical, chemical, physical, electronic property attributed to two main reasons. And because of that, we can classify them into four, from zero confinement to three confinement material, that is from bulk to nanoparticle. And as a result of their diverse architecture, they've, we've given them so many names. If they apply like three, we call them nano three. I can still remember in those days with Professor Nerish when we formed the nano three and we said this must be a Christmas tree. So the architecture determined the name. And because of these diverse architectures has also led to the application in various field. So that is the short introduction I want to give to you so that I can go to the main aspect of this lecture, quantum dot. This is something I've worked for over 13 years. So they are semiconductor nanomaterial with particle less than 10 nanometer. Why are we interested in them? It's because they possess all those fantastic property that no one can find in conventional material. And a lot of method has been reported for their synthesis. But the landmark one was the one by Biwendu et al. at the East Coast in 1993. This was the first paper reported on the synthesis of quantum dot. And if I can still remember, in, as of 2009, this paper was cited 17,655 between 1993 and then 2009. And there are so many problems, and I used to tell my students, you can't solve all the problems, start from somewhere. And because there are, this material cannot be synthesized then in a place like South Africa because of the environmental toxicity. Another group in the West Coast tried to solve some of the problem which is size sorting. And of course, a group in Europe being led by the person that supervised my supervisor. And every time I saw him, I always call him the grandpa. He's now of blended memory, Professor Hobren, who started single source precursor method. Actually, that is what I wanted to do before we realized that, look, the single source method, even though it gives quality material, but the synthesis takes a lot of time, some of the material are not also environmentally friendly. And in 2001, at the beginning of the millennium, another group supervised by Oliver Sato, come with what they refer to as greener synthesis because they were able to replace the toxic dimethyl cadmium with cadmium oxide. And that is when we were now starting to look at what, how can we find a solution? And they made a proclamation in 2003 that it is not possible to synthesize cadmium selenide quantum dots using cadmium chloride. And that is when I came in into the system. How can we solve the problem? The problem of toxicity is there. Also, the material that was produced then, they are only soluble in organic solvent. So we have water solubility, the stability of the material. And also the word green synthesis came at that particular time when I started the synthesis. And these are the six major criteria before a synthesis can be referred to then as green. Now we have 13. And what did we do immediately? We tried to produce cadmium selenide using the same cadmium chloride that was said it was not possible. And the reaction is given there on the board with so many paper. Of course, just to remind people, I didn't do this in space. That was made then in the lab. And this was the material that was produced. And then we can start looking at the characterization. So by the time we got this, not only that we are able to solve the problem, we are also able to produce this material at a lower temperature. We are the first to report this. And these are just the normal characterization of the material to confirm that indeed what we produce is cadmium selenide quantum dot. And these are the morphological aspects. And we are also able from here to explain how did the material come back together from isotropic to anisotropic material. Of course, 
our target is how can we solve the problem of water soluble since our starting material is a uh, soluble in water the solvent is in water immediately we jump in into the synthesis of water soluble material using cysteine as the capping agent this picture here then things have changed now glory to god in south africa took us one year before we can get this result. But now, even in our own lab in UG, with the help of my dean, we can actually produce this. So thank you, Madam Dean, for your help. So from here, we started using all the other materials, like ascorbic acid to produce. We turned because people are complaining, cadmium is toxic, can it work with zinc selenide? We're able to do that. Then there's another important paper, whereby we are able to study how can we produce this material from, pump, from nanoparticles, spherical material, to rod material. And if you want to know more about this, you can read some of the paper. Of course, we are successful with the synthesis, but it still has some shortcoming. One of them is that our method still use top, which is very toxic. So with one of my a PhD student, that's, this is my third PhD student, so we decide to change and say, let's use something that is completely environmentally friendly. Or lake acid and paraffin. And with my collaborator in India, we are able to produce this material and we use it to increase the property of a polymer and epoxy. So this is the material, when you put it in epoxy, it becomes where they pass and the transparency increases because they want to use it for application. And from there, we started seeing how can we use this method to produce an isotropic material that is rod, and then we explain all the mechanism of reaction for this. We also try with one of my master students, can we make this to be water soluble? Because most of the problem then is when you do surface exchange, you lose the optical property. We successfully do this without losing the optical property of the material. And of course, from there, we try to put this, which collaborator also in India, into a bowl polymer called polylactone because they want to use it in band-aid using the fluorescence material. From here, we notice that one of the major problems is I'm interested in the biological aspect, and for you to do that, you need a material that will flourish at near infrared. Cadmium selenide cannot do that. You need to shift to cadmium telluride. What about the problem with cadmium telluride at that particular time? The problem is the source of the telluride, which you need nitrogen gas, and that's when you are thinking of large scale synthesis for the application, for industrial application, is a problem. So what we have done here, our contribution, is this great scientist was able to come with a method that doesn't involve nitrogen. But the problem is, it took them 13 hours before they could produce a material that would flourish at the red region. So with one of my master students, who is now about completing his PhD student, we are able to solve this problem just by using glutathione. And you could see within a space of three hours, we can produce a material that is flourishing in red region. From there, we start to look at the effect of pH on this, so that we can see how can we make the reaction very fast. At pH 12, we actually got what we wanted. Within a space of one hour, you can actually produce a material that can flourish in the red region, as you can see, 30 minutes, 15 minutes. But now we need to check the stability, what will happen in the body, and then we face another problem. The material is not stable at all. So from our knowledge of what we have been doing before, we decide to do the core shell of this material and look at the self ability. This work was done in collaboration with my friend in the collaborator in Japan. And then he was very excited to see this. And when you look at the imaging, another problem starts. We are unable to sleep because this material is highly toxic. So what is the next solution to do? Thank God to Professor Adamson, who supervised me for my first degree. I graduated with both chemistry and biochemistry. And I still remember my 20 amino acid. I said, okay, let's go for amino acid. It will make the material to be about compatible. Yeah, we are going to increase the fluorescence of the material. And you can see remarkable results. This red and purple, just like my clothes, they were able to give a very good luminescence material. And with that, we solved the problem. And it was at this particular time that uh, Dr. Parani came to my group. And we've been working on gelatin, as we are going to see in my uh, next slides. And we said, look, why can't we use gelatin, which is more about compatible, to produce this material? And that is what we, di we did with a remarkable result again. And the problem we've been trying to solve, we're able to solve the, the problem, which is the material is no longer now toxic to the cell. But of course, the problem people here in academia still remain. Going to so many conferences, people will ask, 
but the problem is cadmium. So from there, we shift a little bit to tertiary quantum dot, producing material that are not toxic. And I can tell you this is what we are doing in our lab now. We don't produce toxic material. We are producing material that are not very toxic. And what are the challenges? These are the challenges. Unlike the two Cs or the binary that we are using before, they always resulted in blue sheets. So these are the three problems that we need to solve and find a better way of synthesizing this material. I'm glad to tell you that we have done this and we are using pressure cooker that everybody used to cook rice to produce this. So we can produce two liter, three liter, five liter. My students are here, they are experts. I can see Telukile smiling that yes, if you need it, we can produce it for you. And those master students that have left, they can do, be able to do this. And of course, we are able to publish this work in MRS communication. Why do I put this? When we send this paper for conference, I was not going, the editor wrote to me and said, please come and publish this paper in our journal. And that is how we were able to publish this work. Now, just for you to know, these are the self ability. This is against normal kidney fibroblasts. You could see that the material is not toxic, even with cervical cancer cell. But when you get 100, you start losing little toxicity. That is what you want. We don't want the material to affect the normal cell. But the cancer that we don't want, the material should be able to destroy it. And from there, we've done series <coughs> of synthesis. This is the work done by Mrs. Sinkalala. I think she's sitting down that side and for a master's degree. And we've produced a lot of this. This is also another work done by my master's student, whereby we synthesize silver indium sulfide and we use it for the detection of ascorbic acid. While we are working on this, the collaborator said, I need the rod. And nobody has done that. Then we started looking at what to do. And we are able to come up with this. And we are able to produce this rod. So this was the first paper reported on the synthesis of nano rod for the silver indium selenide. And that is all the work that we have done so far, and many more on that quantum dot. Quickly, let me run through what we have done on that meta nanostructure. I will not go through the history. I will just go straight to what has been my contribution. When we came to this with an intern student, I have an intern student then when I was at Water Susulu, and we are looking that people are writing green synthesis, green synthesis, green synthesis, but when you look, it is not completely green. At one point or the other, somebody will had whether ammonia, sodium hydroxide, to make sure that the particle becomes smaller in size. So we stop on a paper whereby this guy reported the synthesis of silver nanoparticle using gelatin and glucose. And the size is between 6 to 11 nanometer. But when he wants to reduce the size to like 3 to 5 nanometer, he needs to add a little ammonia into it. So then from our simple knowledge of chemistry, we said, okay, what if we increase the lithium tank? And what we have done is just to use matos, which we produce two molecules of glucose, and then we increase the reaction rate. And this is what we have. And from here, we've published a lot of work. This is the way the material looks like under the HR term. And you can see that, indeed, the particle is very small compared to when you use the glucose alone. And from here, of course, I always like starch. We also try to use starch, and we get something very remarkable. Unlike what we add with when, uh, when we use gelatin, and what happens here, go against all the other norms. Because before, you need to produce bigger material, and with time, the material starts dividing into smaller ones. But with starch, we are able to produce a material that is small from the beginning. This is the way the material arrange themselves, and we try to the likeness arrangement. And the material highly crystalline. And if you want to know more about this and the mechanism behind it, the paper is there. And from there, another PhD student of mine, we now say, now that we're able to do this, can we start testing the antibacteria, the cytotoxicity of this, even against human leukemia cell, and use them to send environmental pollutants like hydrogen peroxide. And this was the work that was supported in this journal. In order to increase their catalytic activity, we try to incorporate this material into multi wall carbon nanotube. And when my students, Yes, Nehemiah went to IUPI conference to present this work. The next thing that I saw was two days after I received a letter from the editor to say the presentation was accepted and was nominated to be published in this journal. And that's how we submitted the paper. Now, during my citation by my dean, you hear that we are using uh, indigenous South African plant. I was sitting down in my office at Water Susulu when a colleague came and said, come and see this plant. They are just causing problem, and they named them water hyacinth, and they were being brought from South America to South Africa. So we said, what can we do? So we went into the literature with another master student of mine, 
And we discovered that these materials are a lot of cellulose, but nobody has used them for the synthesis of nanomaterial. And we became the first group to synthesize this. And since then, people have started using this material for the synthesis of silver nanoparticles. And we look at the effect of pH on it, and later we use uh, microwave radiation to make sure that we can produce a material that is, cannot be more than three uh, nanometer. So this, also another master student that came, because we so like this plant, also used the material to prepare platinum nanoparticle and use it for so many things like radiation. So why we are, from the work of the plant extract, then Professor Sonka, Professor Yedeji, uh, Professor Yedeji, male and female, they, we came together and said, why can't we start working on South African plants and see how we can use this material as a value added chain. So two PhD were supervised here. We were given 2.5 million rand by the IKS and the rest is history today. The student finished. We were able to successfully produce this material. And I can tell you, uh, Madam Dean, where Professor Edeji is sitting there, we've also started commercialization. This thing was accepted, and they've soon put it into big commercialization. These are the other work that we have done with South African plant. And just recently, with another PhD student registered in our faculty, with uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Vuyo, in biotechnology, we were able to use another plant, Combrentum etrophinum, to synthesize nanomaterial. This plant is very good. I won't say more than that until when we do the necessary thing. Uh, the researchers know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so from there, with my collaborator in Japan, we are trying to look at how can we solve the problem of cancer? Because when I met this guy, and I discovered that there is high prevalence of cancer in Japan, they said one out of four people have cancer. So I said, okay, look, I'm a chemist, you're a biomedical engineer, we can collaborate. And the guy said, look, look at gold nanorod, I want to use it. I want it at 1064 nanometer, but there is a major problem. The material is very toxic. So with another master's student, we go into this, and we try to use gelatin to modify this. I will not go into details, but I'll just show you. This is the result that we got. We are able to remove the toxicity, which I'm going to show you, by replacing the CTAB, which was one causing the toxicity with the gelatin. And this is the image of the HR10 image of the gold nanorod. This material, we were able to do technical no hour of it, which is called semi-patent, with a number together with our collaborator. Now, what is amazing about this? Everybody use PEG because they want to, it's going to generate it. So what we discover is, by the time we look at the heat that this gelatin that we produce, we generate, we discover that at the 80, is able to generate enough heat to destroy the tumor inside the body. And we compare it with PEG, which everybody is using. The PEG is in blue. This is our gelatin, and we discover that gelatin can actually generate more heat than the peg that people are using. And then I will show you the application of this under the application section. So we want to see, as the heat destroy the property of the material? So you could see, this is the gelatin alone, and after the heat, nothing has happened to our material. Now this is the self-ability, it's well comparable with peg. This is the setup, so you can see that it's highly toxic. And this is what happens when you apply heat. At 100 microgram per me, the tumor is actually destroyed. This is this material. I took this picture just a month ago, since two years. It still remains intact. Nothing has happened to that material. And this is also another landmark of our work, that in our lab now, we can produce 800 nanometer, 1,000 nanometer, 1064 nanometer, not by guesswork, but we can't give you the formula. It belongs to UJ. <laughs> another thing that we are also interested in is in using magnetic nanoparticle. Why? Because we want to solve the problem of photodynamic therapy, which I'm going to show you in the future. With this, a PhD student of my work on this, and these are some of the paper that we have published using this material, both for water purification. And we also look at the ferrite because of my collaborators who are interested in the optical application, especially the magnetic property because they want to make some chips. And we are also, we are interested in the biology collaborator in the optical. So we said, okay, as you are doing the optical on one hand, let us also look at the antimicrobial property of this material. And that paper was published in material engineering. This is the work that we just published this year, looking at the, some optical properties, magnetic property defect in this material before they can be able to use them for optical application. And lastly, let me go to the last aspect of this talk, which is the significance of nanomaterial 
in our macro world. And like I've said, I'm going to base it on cancer because we've done a lot of work. Like the dean said, having over 120 journal publications, 40 minutes is not enough to talk about them. So let's quickly go. So for the sake of people that doesn't know, cancer always occur in four stages. And I purposely bring this for the sake of my friend because I want them to live long. That cancer is the second leading cause of death globally. That one is not a new information since 2008. But this is where I'm going. The five leading behavioral. So while you leave this place today, if you don't remember anything, please watch your diet. Take a lot of fruit and vegetable. And please do exercise. And please, my friend, avoid tobacco and excess of alcohol. So if it is possible for me, I would have monitored what is going to happen after this lecture. <laughs> so that you can live long and avoid cancer. So the statistics are there. So why do we come in? This is, we can see, this is the different cases, lung, breast, electron. And this is the dead. Lung is still leading. But this is what concerns me. You can see, in terms of incidence, Africa is number two. Let's look at the death rate. Now, we are increasing. So if care is not taken, it means if you don't find solution to this on time, there will be a catastrophe. And that is why these are the conventional way of treating this material, which we know has not been that very good, satisfactory with many side effects. And then there are new ways. One of them is photodynamic and phototherma therapy, which we are doing in our group. And the reason is all the things listed here. What is most important? We need a photosensitizer. We need a light. And the oxygen is already there because it's present in your body. And that is why we say the method is minimally invasive. We refer to those drugs as pro-drug because they only become active in the body when you apply light onto them. Before then, you are very free. That is why they are normally applied them in the dark. And these are some of the perforin that people have produced. They also have their own shortcoming, even though the reason why we're interested in them is because they can be easily localized into the tumor. That is, greater percentage goes into the tumor in the body. They can generate the toxic material that is going to destroy the tumor. So some size, sense of selectivity, and they're highly compatible. But what is the problem? The problem is the optical absorption is limited. It's only for surface. There is photosensitivity. These two problems have been solved. This is where we come in, the water solubility. And how can we make sure that we can tell all this material that it only goes to where the cancer is and the normal cell will not be affected? And this is the way we are doing it. By conjugating them to nanomaterial, we make them to be water soluble, as I'm going to show you. And by using magnetic material, we can apply magnetic feed. So all the material goes only to the site where the magnet is. And then we can apply the therapy, and the normal cell will not be affected. This is one of the work that uh, Telukile did, whereby we take this perforin, we conjugate them to the quantum dot, and then, like I said earlier, we are able to produce a material that can generate a lot of go into the cancer and destroy the cancer. And with a collaborator in Brazil three months ago, so then this is what I went to Brazil to go and do. So you could say, I didn't go there to go to Sao Paulo. And we could see this is our material. And the collaborator is very excited. And because of that, they want to form another collaboration with our university. Thank you, Dean, for making sure that it has been signed. And they are very excited. So this is the material. This is without light. And once you apply the light, you destroy the material. That's not the only work. This is the one we did on magnetic material. When we conjugate this material, which is called spion, together this work we started with Professor Sonka, spion, a super paramagnetic ion oxide nanoparticle, we conjugate it to porphyrin. So what we could see is, by the time you apply the magnetic feed, you could see that you can increase the uptake of the material in the magnet. And of course, with the help of the DIN again. 
Because when I came, I said I'm working on PDT, and the dean just gave me a professor in this university who is a chair on PDT. And this work was done here, and we are able to prove that this material, when you apply magnetic field to it, and we vary the amount, you just need two micrograms per meal. And with 10 microjoules, you can easily destroy the cancer. And this is the paper, proudly, University of Johannesburg work. Everything here was done here. And the PhD student has graduated. So now, this is a new thing that we are doing with the collaborator in Japan. We are using a new method called lymphatic delivery. It's far, far better than the intravenous or the conventional one because the material just moved from synclean fluid to the pulmonary fluid. And you can apply the material here. So now, you, the material don't need to travel for long. You just go to the site of the cancer and then we can apply. This is one of the work that we did. We could see, if you look here, this is how you appreciate the work. This is the tumor. Without any treatment is growing. If you apply gold nanorod alone, it's still growing. Laser alone cannot do the work, but when we use our material, within a space of three days, completely we destroy the tumor. And this work, we publish it in scientific reports, and it is this work now that makes the people in Japan to say they are going to start clinical trial. So the dean, I will still come in the next <laughs> six months when we'll be going again to Japan for the clinical trial on the this one. What are the other applications that we have done? We have been able to, because we are very conscious about our environment, we just discovered that my wife being a dentist, because when you want to, you go to the dentist, they give you hydrogen peroxide. So one of my students were so curious that, is this really what we have? They will put on the label 30%. So what we did was to use a paper strip, uh, our filter paper, and we just put the material there, and then just using software for the industrial revolution. We don't need to go to the lab. And then what we are able to discover will shock you. This is what they are selling. This is the way it's supposed to be. Give out hydrogen bubbles, but this is what you have. It's not giving anything. So that is why when you use this material, you keep using a lot and lot of it because they have lost their property. And this we can test within a few minutes. Other work that we have done with Professor Arotiba is but the moment we declared, discovered that this material, they are not toxic, we use them as an electrochemical biosensor for cholesterol, and this material is very selective in the presence of interferon. And Prof, we are coming now with a material that doesn't have carbon, so be expecting us. Thank you very much for your collaboration. <laughs> now, this is another work that we have done. How can we detect heavy metals that are present in water? If you look at my opening slide, you will know that I'm a citizen of two countries, South Africa and Nigeria. Both of them, they have problem of water. Now, this is one of the work that I've done with my master students, and we have been able to produce a material that can selectively detect mercury inside the water. What is the ongoing work that we'll be doing? First, when we look at the cancer, instead of conjugating two material together, now we, want, we are producing a new material that can give both phototherma and the photodynamic therapy. And two of my students presently, they are in Japan. They are not here. They are working on this, and we've been making good progress. So soon, my day, you will soon see another paper and patent on this. So I won't be talking so much about our future work because these are some of the things that we are looking forward to move from just ordinary synthesis to large scale. And of course, for the four I have, we are working on with the people in Japan, how can we produce a nano robot? Because we have a material now that can detect, that can attack the cancer. Is it possible to, with the help of the people in the IT to produce a robot, and the professor said it's possible, so that that robot, once it goes into the body, it just stay at the point of the blood vessel, and it makes sure that the blood vessel couldn't go in. Therefore, the tumor will be starved of food, and automatically, the tumor will die. Also, with our membrane, because time will not allow, we started working on treatment of water, because we know water is a problem. So, but in terms of IR, for IR, what we are planning to do is to combine this membrane. We've been able to produce super hydrophobic membrane, and the, super, and the content angle is at 160 degrees. It's in that, inside the pamphlet, but I'm not showing it here. So that if we combine them with robots, we can be able to produce a material that can go and tell us the condition that we need to use to determine the material. These are also some of the work that we are doing in my group. We are working on agriculture in, 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 in collaboration with people at NN, um, Cape Peninsula University at Wellington Campus. And this is what we are doing in, our, in my group as a whole. And then just please, just 30 seconds, 
I will want you to just join me in giving the honor to whom honor to do. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, well, I have to start by stating that I'm a physicist. I'm not a chemist. And when I came here uh, this evening, the registrar, the first question the registrar asked me was, you are a physicist, and the inaugural lecture is in chemistry, and what is the connection? I didn't want to give him that answer because I didn't want to compromise my introduction. <laughs> and, but uh, and, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, Professor Olua Femi just said, material science. <laughs> so um, just to give you a brief idea, when I first started my research in PhD, <clears throat> it was in the US, um, I went to the Department of Material Science and my professor there gave me a book. That book was titled Where Physics, Chemistry and Biology Meet. And I asked him, where do they actually meet? And then he said, material science. <laughs> And I was in the Department of Material Science. So that's where physics, chemistry, and, and, and biology meet. They meet in the material science. So the common denominator between myself and Professor Olua Femi is material science. That's what I wanted to say. So how do I know Professor Olua Femi? I, I first met him in 2005. Um, he was the student at the University of Zululand under the supervision of Professor Nerish Reva Prasadu, and then he visited our laboratory in the University of the Free State by then. He was working on um, his PhD, and he was using our laboratories and our facilities by then. Um, um, he, should I tell them? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, well, it was shortly after I have established the, the, the chemistry department in the physics department in the University of the Free State. He used our facility to synthesize um, his materials and use our facility also to characterize his materials. I was very much impressed by his determination, dedication, amongst other things. He literally was sleeping in the laboratory. <laughs> And I was very much impressed by his diligence. He was sleeping in the laboratory. Yeah, you will you leave him there in the evening, you will find him there in the morning, and you will see he even had a coach where he was actually sleeping. And I was very much, I was very much impressed. So myself and Professor Reva Prasadu were the first cohort of scientists who graduated in nanoscience and nanotechnology. And then um, when, when nanoscience and nanotechnology became fashionable, um, we participated in development of nanoscience nanotechnology in South Africa, and our task was to roll out a strategy for nanoscience and nanotechnology and to carry out fundamental research in nanoscience and nanotechnology and to develop um, a strategy to position a South Africa as a role player in nanoscience and nanotechnology through bilateral collaborations and our task was also to develop critical mass of nano scientists and nano South Africa. I mean, I mean nano scientists in South Africa, and we also had to develop also uh, some nano ethics to make sure that the research that is done in South Africa is actually ethical. Uh, you have you have heard Professor Oluwafemi talking about toxicity and non toxicity. So that was our task 
So we did that. And Professor Oluafemi was a beneficiary of all these things that we started. And what amazed me a lot is that um, what, what he did when now he became, we graduated after graduation, he also participated in the development of nanoscience, nanotechnology, R&D in South Africa. Because if you listen to his presentations, he talked about uh, supervising students, which is development of um, critical mass of nanoscience and nanotechnology in South Africa. And he publishes prolifically in nanoscience and nanotechnology. And he, also he is also involved in development of research infrastructure. I think all this, the institutions where we worked before, they can actually testify to that, including uh, UJ. So he was a beneficiary and he's also a contributor to R&D in nanoscience and nanotechnology in South Africa. And I think he deserves a big round of applause for that. And he is doing so. Again, uh, the Department of Science and Technology focused on, 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 four, on three areas, which is um, water, health, and energy. And I think if you listen to his talk, he was talking about water treatment. He was also talking about health, which is photodynamic therapy, which is treatment of cancer. He, he, he didn't say anything about energy, but if you ask me why is this component is missing, energy is me. I'm doing energy efficiency to complement what he is doing. So he is doing cutting edge research in the synthesis and characterization of nanomaterials. He's doing a, a, a great job in that. Um, I want to testify to that. I, I speak to him every now and then if I need advice on the synthesis and characterization. And um, he is um, working on the materials that are used in cancer treatment, which is very important. He has mentioned that in his talk. And he's also producing materials that are used in um, um, the water treatment, which is very important. And all what he is doing is actually talking to the national systems of innovations of this country, health, um, water, and, um, 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 and energy efficiency. So the other important that he mentioned, it's, it's, it's nanotechnology and the fourth industrial revolution. It's not a secret that the University of Johannesburg is the leader in the fourth industrial revolution in this country. But now, um, in the university's quest for the fourth industrial revolutions, I would like to send a very strong message that there is nanotechnology component to that. And when I talk about nanotechnology, I talk about Professor Ulua Femitebi. So when your VC talks about all the beauty of the fourth industrial revolutions, uh, artificial intelligence, he must remember that there is nanotechnology before artificial intelligence, there is nanotechnology before the fourth industrial revolution. So what I'm trying to say is that the deans, the registrar, and the VC, they must remember that there is nanoscience and nanotechnology, and at least they have somebody here in the name of Professor Ulua Femi Tobi to help them add into, into that. And I would like us to give him a round of <laughs> So um, based on his presentation and based on what the country is planning to do, I hope you are aware that we don't have the Department of Science and Technology anymore. We have the Department of Science and Innovation. The focus is no longer on the fundamental research in nanoscience and nanotechnology. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't do that. We, sh we, should, we should continue to do fundamental research. But now the focus is going to be in the innovation. What do you do from now onwards? So what we're what, what we supposed to do, what, 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 the, what the government want us to do from now onwards now is to um, look at technology transfer. What do we do with this material? We can, we can produce, we can synthesize advanced materials. but. That's the language which the politicians do, do not understand. What they understand is the technology. That's why they have changed the name of science and technology to the Department of Science and Innovation. So what I want to advise Professor uh, uh, Olua Femi to start doing now is to start thinking about innovation. Thank you so much. Thank you.
you, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mutwaya Borwa, for that excellent response and for reminding us what is a true scholar. True scholar is not only doing the research, but he builds and shares. And I think that is the example that we have seen this evening um, in you, Prof. Um, Prof. Olaf Wafemi, uh, congratulations again, and thank you for your fascinating story that you shared with us. You know, the important work that you are doing, the impact of your work is evident, but also listening to you, I can see why you're such an inspiration to students. I mean, you mentioned so many of your role models and your inspiration that brought you to this point, but I think you are an inspiration to so many students, and uh, we are so happy to have you here at UJ. Uh, Prof, um, uh, you also mentioned, Prof Martin, that uh, it is uh, such an uh, asset for South Africa, but of course in particular for UJ. So we are so proud of you, and uh, we are so grateful that we could have shared in this part of your journey this evening, and we wish you just the very, very best for, for your journey that has only now begun, it seems. There's many, lots of work to be done, and that innovation that Prof Martin referred to. So congratulations again, and thank you to both of you. So this brings us then to the end of uh, this evening, and uh, we are now asking you to join us just next door for some refreshments. And Prof. Uh, Olofeni will now come forward, and we will do the roping, and then take some photos, and then he will, um, uh, you know, stand here at the door to receive your congratulations. That is that. So I just want to say that uh, since student recruiting is also part of my portfolio, I'm recruiting that little guy over there for a future student of UJ. Please join us next week. <laughs>